This is one of the most remote places in America. The wilderness of the Cascade Mountain Range sits on the western edge of the continent close to the Canadian border. The mountains here have forbidding names, Mount Terror, Damnation Peak, Mount Despair, echoing the tragedy of those who tried and failed to conquer this godless terrain. In the summer of 1956, Jack Kerouac, at that time a little-known American writer, came to spend 63 days as a fire watcher on Desolation Peak. Desolation Peak is so remote. Uh, it, it was always the most remote uh, fire station in the Forest Service. It's, uh, it's just a few miles south of the Canadian border. When Kerouac was there, there was no road that went anywhere near it. Uh, it was uh, a three-day trip uh, by tug barge, uh, horseback, uh, and pickup truck uh, from Marble Mount, which is where the ranger station is. Now you can make it in one day. Little has changed on the top of Desolation since Kerouac was here. Fire watchers still work in the primitive cabin, using exactly the same firefinding equipment as he did. Well, my main job here is to watch for forest fires um, and to detect smokes as soon as I can. And this is the same thing that Jack Kerouac would have had to do as his job here too. And in fact, this is the exact same firefinder that he used. It's the Osborne Firefinder Model 1934. I believe that Jack Kerouac went to, went to school, actually, a little week-long fire school or something to um, learn how to do this. I imagine for Kerouac, it was probably pretty lonely because he was here for 63 days without um, any company. Kerouac came to Desolation in his mid-thirties. He'd been writing and travelling for most of his adult life. But the books that were to make his name had yet to find a publisher. He came here to escape, but he also came in search of a spiritual experience. It was eight or nine weeks of mountain solitude. No distractions whatsoever. You could uh, read, write, sing at the top of your lungs, meditate, and if you were lucky, uh, have a vision. Kerouac had been, at this point, uh, in intense uh, Buddhist studies for three years, and he felt that he was primed for a spiritual breakthrough. So he was going up there uh, with the uh, idea of uh, really having the sort of uh, uh, vision in solitude. And um, he wrote to a, a friend uh, before he left, uh, if I don't get a vision up on Desolation Peak, my name ain't William Blake. But something went badly wrong on the top of Desolation Peak. What Kerouac experienced in the small cabin was not enlightenment, but a sense of loneliness and despair worse than any he'd ever known. A feeling of desolation so profound that it would change the whole course of his life and ultimately ruin him as a writer. With all due respect, even Jesus in the wilderness and Buddha under the bow tree only spent 40 days in their trials. So who knows what uh, demons or devils Jack struggled with uh, in his 63 days. Desolation is the beginning of the end for him as a writer. And certainly the, what happens next, fame hits and he never really, he loses his powers. Within a few short months of coming down from the mountain, Kerouac became the most famous writer in America. His book, On the Road, was a publishing phenomenon. Overnight, he was called upon to be the spokesman for a generation, the King of Cool, 
the first writer celebrity of the television age. Jack, uh, I've got a couple of square questions, but I think the answer would be interesting. How long did it take you to write on the road? Three weeks. How many? Three weeks. Three weeks. Amazing. How long were you on the road itself? Seven years. Seven years. Well, a lot of people have asked me why did I write that book or any book. All the stories I wrote were true because I believed in what I saw. I was traveling west one time at the junction of the state line of Colorado. It's arid western one and the state line of poor Utah. I saw in the clouds huge and massed above the fiery golden desert of Evenfall the great image of God with forefinger pointed straight at me through halos and rolls and gold clothes. Kerouac's appearance in the Steve Allen show should have been a moment of great success for him. It was a moment of triumph. His book had just come out to enormous acclaim and attention. But the Kerouac we see there is riven with contradiction. He's almost unable to control himself, so overcome is he with shyness and self-doubt. He was one of the first writers to get the full media treatment to go on television. Television was, was really new in those days. The talk show had just been invented. And everybody sort of wanted a piece of him. I remember having a dream at that time uh, of, of being at a reading with Jack and that people literally tried to tear him apart limb from limb after the reading. There was that kind of avidity that people had. It just sort of kicked the sides out of everything. And it was suddenly overnight, it was a whole new scene, just as when rock hit the music scene in this country in the 60s. It's, it's, it's very similar. Um, in fact, it was the beginning of the same revolution. On the face of it, Kerouac might have looked like literature's first rock and roll superstar, but beneath the confident public image, he was a bundle of insecurities. And many of his troubles had their roots back in his hometown of Lowell, Massachusetts. Lowell is a former steel town on the Merrimack River, once crossed by Kerouac's French-Canadian ancestors. This gentle backwater of the Depression era is a sleepy presence in all Kerouac's writing. For him, it would always be a place of childhood magic. Though famous as the writer who travelled, who left home, infatuated with the road out, Kerouac always remained half in love with his hometown and half obsessed with all its plain American values. He was a member of a working class family. He had a, a tough road to hoe. His family didn't want him to be a writer. A very <laughs> uh, uh, difficult way to make a living. His father was, a, was in the printing business. His father was a, a very tough man. His mother worked all her life. And his family we were devout Catholics, and that was, that was also a, a very important influence upon Jack, and he remained Catholic, I think, through his life. So the, the, the whole Lowell experience, um, I think, had to do with the deeply conservative side of Jack. There were always two sides to Jack. There was that conservative traditional side and, and a much wilder side. Kerouac's childhood was dominated by Catholicism. It brought out an intensity that would always disturb him. When his older brother Gerard died of rheumatic fever and became the family saint, a deep mourning began that would always haunt his brother, the writer. I think he had tremendous guilt for surviving uh, his brother, his older brother Gerard, and I think that was a very, very crucial event in Jack's life, and it shaped his whole relationship, his, his whole incredible attachment to his mother. His mother, uh, from the day that uh, Gerard died, always held Gerard up to uh, Jack as uh, Gerard being a saint and to try to uh, uh, be as good of, as his brother Gerard was. Uh, but I also have the impression that uh, he never quite fulfilled the task. Living up to his mother's expectations was a burden Kerouac carried lightly in his youth. 
He was a talented footballer, a classic All-American boy. His prowess on the gridiron, coupled with his intellectual abilities, secured him a scholarship to New York's famous Columbia University. Here his writerly ambitions nudged closer to reality and he was encouraged by new friends Allen Ginsberg and William Burroughs. The three of them together would become the leaders of the Beat Generation. Columbia is a good university and New York is exciting. And he meets characters, he meets Ginsberg at Columbia, he meets Burroughs. And with them, the, you know, entered this street, 42nd Street, Times Square, post-war world of hustlers and benzedrine inhalers and fast jazz. And, but at the same time, we have to keep in mind that at Columbia, he's also seriously studying the history of the novel, studying in these years Melville, Thomas Wolfe, you know, Goethe, Rambo, Huxley. This was a universe away from the small town life of Lowell. Kerouac thrilled to the new pace and was quickly caught up in the excitements of the big city. Oh, he had told me he was a writer when we were talking and I must say my interest picked up a little. Plus the fact that he was so damn handsome and sexy looking. And uh, then he asked me where he lived. He said, I'll take you home and uh, in Brooklyn. He said, oh my God, you know. So we got on the train, Sea Beach Express, and when, uh, as we were going over the Brooklyn Bridge, he, uh, my God, he carried over that wonderful view out there. But this guy was like uh, uh, hyper. He was hyper all the And he looked at the window, he said, oh my God, that's a gorgeous view. And he went running up and down the subway train and people were staring at him. And I thought he was on something. I thought he'd taken a little, he'd popped one and be, you know, bef when I didn't look or, you know, behind my back. He struck me as somebody who was trying to be very hip and really was a kind of nice, sweet guy at bottom and rather simple. He was shy, internalizing, reserved, not wanting to be the center of attention, more the observer. I think he felt bumbling and gauche in his spontaneity as a person that he would blurt out the wrong candid thing. And when you travel in art circles, despite the fact that he had a good education, he didn't speak English until he was five years old. He grew up speaking a Canuck patois. He'd have dreams in which he'd be amongst society people and movie stars, Olivia de Havilland. His sister would come up to him and he'd try and give her the brush off because she was talking in Joual, this patois of French. Kerouac felt more at home in the anonymous streets and jazz clubs of New York. Here he found the heart of his lifelong fascination with America's subterranean lowlife, the world of beat, the dark world of street life. It was in the sweet, brash wail of the street, the new sound of Charlie Parker's jazz, that Kerouac discovered his new way of writing. He wanted to write like Parker played, letting it all flow spontaneously. This was what Charlie Parker said when he played, all is well. He had the feeling of early in the morning, like a hermit's joy, or like the perfect cry of some wild gang at a jam session, wail, whop. Charlie burst his lungs to reach the speed of what the speedsters wanted, and what they wanted was his eternal slowdown great musician and a great creator of forms that ultimately find expression in mores and what have you. Musically as important as Beethoven, yet not regarded as such at all, a genteel conductor of string orchestras in front of which he stood, proud and calm, like a leader of music in the great historic world night, and wailed his little saxophone, the alto, with piercing clear lament, in perfect tune and shining harmony, toot. Charlie Parker was a great hero of his, with whom he identified very much, I think. Uh, as he said at one point about the uh, founders of Bop, Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie and Thelonious Monk, that they were not only misplaced in the, the white nation, but misnoticed for what they were. And I think he thought of himself as a, 
misplaced in the white nation and misnoticed for what he was. Inspired, Kerouac wrote obsessively, filling piles of notebooks. These were the raw material for his masterpiece, On the Road. He documented his low-life travels through the great American West in search of kicks and new experiences. Kerouac's real vision was a vision of America that no longer exists. It was a vision uh, very similar to that of Thomas Wolfe, not Tom Wolfe, the, the uh, para-journalist, but Thomas Wolfe, the, the author of Look Homeward Angel. His hero rode across the landscape, across the darkening landscape, and saw America from the windows of a, of a train. And it was a sweeping vision of America, and Kerouac had that same vision, only in his case it was from the window of a speeding car. So, in America, when the sun goes down, and I sit on the old broken down river pier watching the long, long skies over New Jersey, and sense all that raw land that rolls in one unbelievable huge bulge over to the west coast, and all that road going, and all the people dreaming in the immensity of it. In Iowa, I know by now that children must be crying in the land where they let the children cry. And tonight the stars will be out, don't you know that God is Pooh Bear? Like many an American writer before him, Kerouac was fascinated with the idea of the American frontier. He was the unstable, highly educated East Coaster who saw life in the great American West as more real, more authentic. Though Lowell was forever pulling him back with its long ago torments, the West represented a freedom and spirituality. So he ran westward, and sometimes when he got there, nothing awaited him but the discovery that he had to keep on moving down the road, always further down the road. Kerouac starts writing um, in the 40s at a time when the frontier thesis, you know, is still a big part of America thought. We're formed because we had this frontier and the real American culture is always on the frontier and the westward expansion. And um, Kerouac came along and, you know, basically said, well, the, anyone can reinvent the American frontier. They just take a less well-traveled road and throw themselves on the mercy of the universe that is America, and it's a frontier all the way. But, of course, he also really wanted to get to the West, you know, Land's End, San Francisco, and those wonderful incantatory sentences. Old Frisco, with end-of-land sadness. The people, the alley full of trucks and cars of businesses nearabouts, Nobody knew or far from cared who I was all my life, 3,500 miles from birth all opened up and at last belonged to me in great America. And now it's night in 3rd Street. The keen little neons and also yellow bulb lights of impossible to believe flops the dark, ruined shadows moving back of torn yellow shades like a degenerate China with no money. The cat's in Annie's alley. The flop comes on, moans, rolls. The street is loaded with darkness. His writing, when it was published, it just coincided with the gestalt of America at that moment, you know. After the Second World War, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, a large percentage of the popu male population, at least, went into the armed services. Then after the war, a lot of them went home briefly or never went home, and they were uprooted, and an enormous part of the population went west, and there was sort of a westward tilting of the continent, like after the Second World War. And... Uh, this just coincided with Kerouac's writing, so that the song of the open road became uh, everybody's 
everybody's vision. Kerouac was keen to throw himself in the universe of America, but he wasn't much of a driver, and he yearned for a partner who could take him out to America and out of himself. He found that partner in Neil Cassidy, who was the inspired man at the wheel in so many of Kerouac's trips across the continent. Neil was all low-life spontaneity and earthy wit, a perfect foil to the introspective and brooding Jack. He became the model for the Dean Moriarty character in On the Road, the book's great hero. So in the last page of On the Road, I describe how the hero, Dean Moriarty, has come to see me all the way from the West Coast just for a day or two. We've just been back and forth across the country several times in cars and now our adventures are over. We're still great friends, but we have to go into later phases of our lives. So there he goes, Dean Moriarty, ragged in the moth-eaten overcoat he brought specially for the freezing temperatures of the East. Walking off alone, and last I saw him, he rounded the corner of 7th Avenue, eyes on the street ahead, and bent to it again. Gone. He, uh, of course, admired Neil's poise and lack of self-consciousness and his ability to um, get along with everybody um, as they were. And um, uh, any level of society Neil was comfortable with. And so, of course, Jack admired all that as well as his, uh, his brilliant mind. One of the most appealing things is that both of them were the most compassionate men I've ever, ever run across, and they were also very macho. And Kerouac turned writing into a muscular business. High on booze and benzodrine, he hammered out on the road in a three-week flurry of spontaneous prose. I would say in the first half of 1951, I was at my desk at Hawcott Brace, and the phone rang, and it was Jack, and he said, Bob, I've finished it. I said, oh, great, Jack, that's wonderful news. And he said, I want to come over. I said, what, right now? He said, yeah, I have to see you. I have to, I have to show you. I, have to, I want to, uh, uh, you know. I said, okay, come on. Come on over to the office. We were on 46th Street and Madison Avenue. He came into the office looking high, looking, you know, drunk. And he had a roll of paper, like a paper towel to use in the kitchen, you know, big roll of paper under his left arm. And he was, you know... It was, this was a great moment for him. I understood that. He took one end of the roll and he flung it right across my office like a big piece of confetti, you know, right across the desk. And, so. and I thought, hey, this is a strange manuscript. You know, <laughs> never seen a manuscript like this. And he looked at me, waiting for me to say something. I said, Jack, you know you have to cut this up. It has to be edited. And his face flushed and he said, There'll be no editing on this manuscript. I said, why not, Jack? We, we were. He said, this manuscript has been dictated by the Holy Ghost. On the Road wouldn't be published for another six years. In the meantime, Kerouac made a living of a kind doing odd jobs and working on the railroad. Though little of his writing was in the public domain, he continued to write long and hard, capturing in his manuscripts the working lives of people the length and breadth of the continent. There was a little alley in San Francisco, back of the Southern Pacific Station at 3rd and Townsend, in red brick of drowsy, lazy afternoons with everybody at work in offices, in the air you feel the impending rush of their commuter frenzy. As soon they'll be charging en masse for market and sansom buildings on foot and in buses and all well-dressed through working man Frisco of walk-up truck drivers. And even the poor grime be marked third street of lost bums, even Negroes so hopeless and long left east and meanings of responsibility and try that now all they do is stand there spitting in the broken glass, sometimes 50 in one afternoon against one wall at 3rd and Howard. Here's all these Milbray and San Carlos neat necktied producers and commuters of America and steel civilization rushing by with San Francisco Chronicles and green call bulletins, not even enough time to be disdainful. 
They've got to catch 130, 132, 134, 136, all the way up to 146. Till the time of evening supper in homes of the railroad earth, when high in the sky the magic stars ride above the following hot shot freight trains. It's all in California. It's all a sea. I swim out of it in afternoons of sun-hot meditation in my jeans with head on handkerchief on brakeman's lantern or, if not working, on book. I look up at blue sky of perfect lost purity and feel the warp of wood of old America beneath me. That free style was, was, was very surprising. People, people were writing, you know, very, very sort of conventional sort of English prose. Uh, and, and suddenly, uh, here's this writer with these, you know, these very long sentences, long breaths, um, even making up words, a lot of things thrown in there for sound, for rhythm, rather than the sort of strict grammatical prose. Uh, at the same time, Jack had a lot of control over what he was doing because he had done a great deal of writing before he, you know, he took off in that new direction. So there, there was there was control over it, but um, it was it was a, a very very open, free, freely associative style, and that was really a breath of fresh air on the American literary scene. But Kerouac paid a heavy and painful price for his writing. His nomadic existence, working long hours on the railroad, writing hard and drinking harder, were wearing him down. He had no stability in his life, no security, and unlike his great friend Neil Cassidy, he had no family. He finally began to realize he would never be able to uh, be a husband and father. And although he talked about homes with me all the time, and Neil kept talking about how hung up he was with the idea of home, and he would explain how he had never learned to work and keep a job like, as Neil had, and that's why Neil could... Um, take care of this family but he knew he couldn't of course he, he dreamt that he would make enough money writing that he could get married and have a home and children but um, uh, little by little that became less and less likely in the 1950s the Cassidy's lived in San Francisco Neil Cassidy may have been the brother Kerouac had always been in mourning for he'd never got over that early loss and it had left a void at his center Neil was a homemaker and Jack began to see that was something he would never be. In the loneliness of my life, my father dead, my brother dead, my mother far away, my sister and my wife far away, nothing here but my own tragic hands that once were guarded by a world, a sweet attention, that now are left to guide and disappear their own way into the common dark of all our deaths. Sleeping in me raw bed alone and stupid, with just this one pride and consolation, my heart broke in a general despair and opened up inwards to the Lord. Kerouac was always looking for a home and looking for the homes he'd left behind. Perhaps the most comfortable places he found were the anonymous streets and bars and diners all over America where he would be alone or surrounded by loners. That was the life he came to live often enough in towns like San Francisco among the beaten down characters that came to fill his books and his life. Kerouac stumbled through this world with compassion and all the wasted beauty of it poured onto the page in giant manuscripts he carried around and into the blues and songs he wrote on bus tickets. But nothing of his writing would make him happy. Kerouac became the most beat down of all his creations. Kerouac was in this unbelievably painful situation in which he had written approximately 10 books between 1951 and 1957. Some of them he knew with reason were, you know, works that the world would not willingly let die, and yet he could not get them published. And that in itself, I think, is a kind of crucifixion. His whole life became very sort of unstable. Uh, and there's a real sort of de deterioration in his, um, in, in his psyche 
he becomes a little a little paranoid. He becomes depressed. Very de- he, he writes very often about feeling bored, sad, lonely. And by around 1955, 56, he's already beginning to feel that perhaps he's written himself out. But Kerouac went to his fire-watching job in Desolation Peak full of hope. At last, after many years in obscurity, On the Road was about to be published. He imagined his life would improve, but Kerouac's ambition was small-scale. He did not expect riches. It's touching to read in his notebook and to see uh, he, with the proceeds that he expects from On the Road, he wants to buy a new refrigerator for his mother. He wants to get the bathtub fixed. He wants to possibly move her into a a flat in Greenwich Village with no concept of uh, of the huge fame and the amount of money that was going to come to him within the year. Kerouac really went up the mountain in the hope of a spiritual experience that would re energize his work. He had converted to Buddhism a few years previously and was convinced that solitude and meditation would bring about a great transformation in him. He began to turn more and more toward Buddhism but he really used Buddhism as a justification for all his hang-ups and, and as a way of not dealing with, not dealing with them. You know, you know, why deal with them if we're all going to die, if everything is nothing? I think he, he responded to everything emotionally first. And that's why uh, he'll say some very heavy opinion one minute and two minutes later is just as, as uh, uh, adamant about the opposite view. So nobody can ever pin him down as to what it is he really believes because it changed every five minutes. And that's why he went into Buddhism, I'm sure, with all the lovely imagery and so forth. Rather, Neil and I are, are, um, were logical, analytical minds, and you've got to show us, you know, and prove it. it has to be practical. So we analyzed everything. I mean, the why, the causes of everything was what we were after. Fortunately, both of us agreed on this. But Jack wasn't at all. And every time you get close to um, analyzing or, you know, boring home, he'd um, throw up, oh, everything's an illusion, or, you know, go off in some um, poetic something or other. He didn't like standing still and facing things. Desolation Peak is one of the great lonely places. The mountains here are close and imposing. These natural monuments are both peaceful and threatening at the same time. Every tree an eye, every star a word. This would be a great place in which to find silence, a great place to write in, and a great place for a writer to go mad in. Kerouac wrote, When I get to the top of Desolation Peak and everything leaves on mules, and I am alone, I will come face to face with God or Tathagata and find out once and for all what is the meaning of all this existence and suffering and going to and fro in vain. But instead I come face to face with myself. No liquor, no drugs, no chance of faking it, but face to face with old, hateful, Delo as me. I learn that I hate myself because by myself I am only myself. I think it was harder and harder by that time for Jack really to, to be alone. Uh, though Jack always had this sort of fantasy of being a hermit, withdrawing from everything. O oh, ignorant brothers, O oh, ignorant sisters, O oh, ignorant me. There's nothing to write about. Everything is nothing. In desolation, desolation is learned. He knows he's an alcoholic. He knows that He doesn't have the material psychologically to live. He feels he's betrayed his faith, betrayed his family, and he hates himself. The desolation adventure finds me finding at the bottom of myself abysmal nothingness. Worse than that, no illusion even. My mind's in rags. When he came down from the mountain to San Francisco, Kerouac entered into the arms of a kind of savage fame. On the Road was finally published, immediately becoming the Bible of the newly formed Beat Generation. 
Kerouac was embraced as its god, but his mind was wrecked, and because of the experience on Desolation, he found it impossible to deal with the pressures of celebrity. My own feeling is that that if Jack had had a, had a kind of lit, more literary success, you know, had gotten wonderful reviews of On the Road and people had talked about how, how beautiful his prose was and so on, it would have been less destructive for him. Instead, he got a tremendous amount of attention, uh, some of it, a lot of it, very hostile. Jack, I don't think, had any desire whatsoever to be a, to be a culture hero, to be a, a leader. I think that was much more Allen Ginsberg's thing. Uh, Jack was, was, had a certain shyness about himself. He wanted to sort of stand back and, and observe and just sort of be in the shadows. I said, well, Jack, you've had a lot of fame since I, we were last working together. He said, it's been horrible. And I said, what do you mean? He said, it's crazy. I don't have a minute to myself. He said, it's hurt me. It's hurt me very, very much. I can't write. I can't think. His fame was, was a horror to him. He hated the manipulations that he felt were underway with himself as the lamb in the slaughterhouse of fame. As it turned out, they, he did not get the money. He, he got all, all the worst aspects of fame, what Madonna would have loved. I mean, he became a sickening drunk after he got famous. And all kinds of people wanted to be around him for all the wrong reasons. And it helped him feed, uh, fed, fed his own drinking. The City Lights bookstore in San Francisco was the central location for those involved in the beat scene the movement Kerouac was supposed to have created. It was owned by Lawrence Ferlinghetti, who Kerouac turned to as his drinking spun out of control. He uh, wanted to get away from all his drinking buddies back east and the idea was he would sneak into San Francisco and I would meet him at the airport and take him directly to Big Sur and he wouldn't get in touch with any of his drinking buddies here and then he would dry out in my cabin presumably stay all summer and of course it didn't work that way I waited around for his call all one afternoon and finally I heard he's next door in Vesuvio's in the bar <laughs> and we were supposed to see Henry Miller that night we had a date to meet Hen Miller for dinner well, it got to be six o'clock and Kerouac still hadn't left. He was still in Vesuvio's and so he called up Miller and Miller said, uh, I'm, st I'm here waiting and Kerouac said, okay, just stay there. We'll get there. We'll be there in no time. We're leaving now and it's a three hour drive. So seven o'clock passed, eight o'clock passed, still in the bar. So he never did meet Miller. He ended up taking, I, I left and went to Big Sur on my own and, and he never, he got down there in a taxi at three in the morning. He took a taxi all the way from San Francisco. And they let him out in the meadow uh, in the pitch dark and he had a, his brakeman's lantern with him from working on the railroad. And, and he stumbled around the meadow with a brakeman's lantern trying to find my cabin and he never found it. And we found him in the morning flaked out in the, in the open meadow. <laughs> Sound asleep. Neither City Lights nor San Francisco itself could shield Kerouac from the torments of his own fame. But Kerouac's erratic behaviour also emerged from his feeling that the world he believed in was being betrayed. The whole idea of the beat generation had originally meant something very important to a small group of people. It really has to do with a desire to experience everything and to be open to all different kinds of experiences and not to hide every, hide anything and to say, be able to talk openly about everything that had ever happened to you. And that's really what its, its, its original meaning was. It's the beat generation, it's bayat. It's the beat to keep, it's the beat of the heart. It's being beat and down in the world and like old time lowdown and like in ancient civilizations, the slave boatmen rowing galleys to a beat and servants spinning pottery to a beat. During the time that he became famous and, and the media got hold of the whole idea of the beat generation, uh, that idea became, uh, the, origi the original meaning of, of the whole idea became really lost and diffused. 
uh, and it became a kind of lifestyle thing. You know, you could put, you could become a beatnik if you wore black stockings or a beret or dark glasses or, you know, uh, it became it became sort of a absurd, and I think he was sort of humiliated by that. He was so misunderstood and and misrepresented that, and he was just so sensitive that it, he was absolutely crushed. He expected to be accepted as a, a serious literary figure. And then as it went on, and he got the uh, credit for the beat generation and then the father of the hippies, he just was just tortured. They force you into an incredible, incredible position in the world when you want to protest or you want to make your voice known in a benevolent way. And yet, at the same time, you, you're, you're pushed and clubbed, you know, and... and you, make your fe you, you make yourself famous by protest. That's not... Who does? Not you. me. No, why? Make myself famous by singing uh, smut. I made myself famous by writing, <laughs> by writing uh, songs and lyrics about the beauty of the things that I did and the ugliness, too. You're a great you make poet, yourself famous admit. by saying, down with this, down with that, no. throw eggs at this, throw eggs at that. I, I Take hope it not. with you. That's not what I want. I cannot use your abuse. You may have it back. Okay, you still, you're a great poet, and we admire you. In fact, it's your fault that we're like... He wasn't a 60s person at all. He was a depression person. He was, the, he was a 30s person. So you talk about uh, rebellion, rebellion against uh, the American government for any particular reason. To him, I'm sure it would have been uh, heresy. It, it was just not in his... That's not the way he was brought up. Um, all his friends... Not all his friends, but a lot of his friends, you know, had gone to fight uh, in World War II and were killed. And they had all uh, died for uh, the country, at least they thought so. And Jack wasn't going to about to put up with uh, young men who wouldn't uh, support their government. Now, when I say this, I'm not saying that Jack thought that the Vietnam War was right or that it was wrong. That wasn't, he wasn't political in that sense. All I'm saying is that he had a very patriotic feeling for his country. He uh, really thought that many of these 60s leaders, the leaders, not the kids themselves, were uh, in it for the, for the celebrity more than anything else. He has that kind of feeling for America. You know, it wasn't as good to my family as we wanted it to be, but this is our country now, and who are you to knock it? He really believed that America meant something. He wasn't a political creature, so as he had to have politics, he just fell right back on the prejudices of his parents. But partly they were affronting the very source of his imagination, you know, which was um, this, this belief. In, um, in America. The West Coast, the Midwest, the whole of America, none of it could bring real solace to Jack Kerouac. And so he returned to the only person who represented peace for him, his mother, Gabriel. I keep falling in love with my mother. I don't want to hurt her. Of all people to hurt. Every time I see her, she's grown older. But her uniform always amazes me for its Dutch simplicity and the doll she is, the doll-like way she stands, bow-legged in my dreams, waiting to serve me. With her, he could be completely himself and say anything, anytime, totally unselfconscious. And I gather they uh, exchanged uh, very frank <laughs> uh, conversations, but he didn't have to worry at all about um, any audience or what people would think. And to me, I think, it was one of the biggest draws to be with her. He could really relax. Very seldom could he otherwise. He finally took me to meet his mother, which I thought was rather interesting. I mean, I had no, no reason to meet her and so on, but he was, he was very close to his mother. And uh, it was an interesting meeting because um, they lived on Long Island at that time. She worked in a shoe factory. She went into the shoe factory every day and, you know, made shoes, and she was supporting him. And she supported him a good deal of his life. She survived him. She was, she was an interesting woman, a very sturdy, uh, working-class woman, but somehow very genuine and very uh, interesting. And when she met me, she said, uh, you don't look like a publisher. 
And I said, what do I look like? She said, you look like a banker. And this was rather in an accusing tone. <laughs> and then she turned to Jack and she said, you stick with him and give up those bums you hang out with. Kerouac was mistaken for a counterculture hero he never wanted to be. He thought he was celebrating the energy of a neglected part of America, but he was accused of encouraging vice and anti-Americanism. In fact, he was an old-fashioned patriot with a genuine belief in the goodness of the human spirit. He just wanted to wander in the streets and to sing generously of what he saw there. He was no politician. And towards the end of his life, he left the streets altogether, left the world, and stayed at home with his mother, drinking himself to death. It's so hard for Neil to watch him go under and with alcohol, and it just broke his heart. And um, for all of us, it's such a, a disease that you just can't help. And of course, near the end, he was just repulsive. Oh, it was too sad. He was only 47 when he died. And yet, when you look back on it, he well, how many novels did he publish? About 14, 14 or 15 full-length novels. He published a book of poems. He did a film script. He did a book on Buddhism. Did some nonfiction books. And it's, it's a great body of work. So, despite all the... Uh, difficulties he faced, he, uh, he was productive and was, really was truly what he wanted to be from the start, an artist. He came through as an artist. He sensed that he would get long-term cultural vindication for what he was doing. And he wrote in his, uh, in his journal that someday uh, people would be coming to uh, Desolation Peak as pilgrims to uh, give speeches and dedications and uh, to pay homage uh, to him. So, in America, when the sun goes down, and I sit on the old broken down river pier watching the long, long skies over New Jersey, and sense all that raw land that rolls in one unbelievable huge bulge over to the west coast, and all that road going, and all the people dreaming in the immensity of it, and in Iowa I know by now that children must be crying in the land where they let the children cry. And tonight the stars will be out, and don't you know that God is Pooh Bear? The evening star must be drooping and shedding her sparkler dims on the prairie, which is just before the coming of complete night that blesses the earth, darkens all the rivers, cups the peaks, and folds the final shore in. Nobody, nobody knows what's going to happen to anybody besides the forlorn rags of growing old. Think of Dean Moriarty, or even think of old Dean Moriarty, the father we never found. Think of Dean Moriarty. I think of Dean Moriarty. Mm -hmm.